So welcome. It's been a while. This is back to the old routine of the regular frequently asked questions about beekeeping. And today is Friday, October 25th. And this is frequently asked questions about beginner beekeeping, episode 36. So uh, if you tuned in recently, if you're one of my subscribers, you probably got an alert that I was doing a live chat, a live feed. That was a fail. I'm going to work on that, though. We're going to talk a little bit about that at the very end of it. So we're going to see if that's a possibility if people like that. And if you want to do a live chat sometime about beekeeping. So it was a fail. I'm learning iPad pro. Let's get going. By the way, the temperature outside is bad. Of course, it's 50 degrees. That's probably not terrible, but we have rain. The bees are not foraging right now. And uh, the good news is they have lots of resources and the colonies are all set up. This is about backyard beekeeping. So this is small scale backyard beekeeping. I know I've always said, I try to keep my limit at 10 colonies, but unfortunately I have 15 now, and that includes my observation hive. And uh, everybody's ready for winter. So they all have stored up a lot of honey. This was the best honey year I've ever had. Great year for the bees. Why did I expand my apiary? I uh, added those extra five colonies because I'm testing out the hexa cell pre-drawn comb, which is being sold by Better Bee as Better Comb. And they promised, I think, that this month they're gonna have those in stock for those of you who wanna check it out. Did a video about it, so if you wanna look that up, I can put a link down in the description for you. So the other thing is I've put out a robbing station, which is also an open feeding station, and this is part of my winter preparations. So I did a video about that specifically, and uh, I said I was gonna ration it out to them, and I you know, would pull a flow super off, or I would put honey out that was left over from last spring, if you can believe it, and use that to give the forager something to do which would decompress the robbing that would occur at the beehive landing boards. So did that work? Sure did, but I changed. I was going to ration out the boxes, you know, always have a box out there for the robbers to visit and to feed and to draw honey from, and then to bring that back to their uh, colonies. But then I realized we're getting terrible weather, so we're only going to get, you know, maybe one decent day a week. So I've changed, and what you're seeing up in the corner here is what the feeding station looks like now. So I put out several flow supers at one time, because I want those bees, even the hornets, bumblebees, everybody's there. They're all cleaning up the uh, hives for me. And that's part of my winter preparation. I let them get all the sticky residue out of those supers and also the flow supers, the flow hives, the mechanism, the box. They clean it all up. And then all I have to do is put it in winter storage for next spring. So that's pretty cool. But I will talk about a cleaning method also because it's relevant to one of the questions that was posted. If you have a question, all you have to do is write down in the comment section below what your question is. And if it's something that I feel has broad appeal, then we'll talk about it during the next Frequently Asked Questions video. And I'll probably be able to do more of these longer videos uh, as we're getting into the snow season because finally my photography business is slowing down and I can stay inside and do indoor things. And that includes this live chat stuff that we're trying to do. So that's it for the robbing station. It's working out fantastic. It is 150 feet from my apiary to the west. And that means that flying to the robbing and feeding station, they are empty. And when they're loaded with resources and coming back to the apiary, they're coming with the wind. So that helps them too. So think about prevailing winds when you're setting up your open feeding station if it's legal where you live. I know a lot of people in Australia don't do any open feeding, and that's fine. you got to follow your local regulations and stuff. There are concerns about bees rubbing shoulders and getting diseases from one another. So that's my robbing station update. So here's another question that comes up a lot. When I show videos of my landing boards, some of the viewers have seen different colored bees together, and they go, oh, is your colony getting robbed out? Why are those bees different colors? I see dark ones and I see yellow ones and I see all these different colors. Bees in the same colony can be different colors. Here's why. Let's think about the genetics of the colony itself. It is not 100% pure. It's not one type of bee unless 
those bees have come from a queen that was mated under some controlled environment. So those who are doing, who are doing genetic testing and they're genetically modifying their bees and they're trying to control the drones and everything else, you could expect those colonies to have all their workers looking the same because those bees, the queens, are inseminated. That means that in the lab they control the genetics completely so you would see all one color of bee there. Or geographically, you may be isolated so much that uh, you're just inbreeding. So colonies of the same type of bee are all sending out their drones and they're all mating with that queen. And then if they're of the same genetic lines from these outlying colonies, then all of your workers will also look the same. But recently, when I was videoing the bees at my pond, which is a spring-fed pond, and they were drinking water there, two bees right side by side, one was dark and the other one was golden colored. Now the other thing is, someone mentioned in a, a lecture I was listening to once that all bees are black, all bees are dark, the only difference in color is the hairs on the bee's body. Well, based on the observations here, that's not true. Some of the bees themselves, the physical appendages of the bees and everything else are different colors. They're not all black. So it is more than the color of their fur, their hair. So what you're seeing here is a landing board video showing different colored bees and prominently different colored drones. So these bees are different colors, but this is my Saskatras colony. So when they started out, they were all the same color workers. When a queen, a virgin queen flies out and she goes to the drone congregation area and she mates with several different drones. Here where I live, apparently someone's got some Italian bees out there and they must have mated with my queen when my Saskatras colony swarmed. So I mixed with local genetics, but now I have these Italian genetics. What bees have this golden color? So I, you know, went on a quest to find out what these bees are. Then I find out that they're Cordovans, C-O-R-D-O-V-A-N, and it's pronounced Cordovan. And that is a golden colored bee. The, the legs, the body, everything, you can just look at the video and see the differences. So what happened was some of the drones from darker stock mated with the queen on her virgin flight. And obviously some of these Italian bees were fast enough to also mate. A queen may mate with 15, even lately they've said up to 20 drones on their virgin flights, and that's flights plural. A queen may fly out several times and mate at the drone congregation area until she comes back. And then after she's finished with her mating sequences, you're gonna get a colony full of half sisters. Now all of the worker bees that are from the same drone and the same queen, of course, will be full sisters. And that's where you see consistent coloration. And then those that are from a different drone, but have the same queen, will have different coloration possibly. And that's what happens. And that's why within the same colony, when you're looking at your brood frames and you're inspecting your box, you may see several different variations in the hair color of the bees and also the physical body color of these bees. And the most uh, dramatic example of that are these cordovans. Now, I don't think my stock's ruined. I just have now traits of both of those. So they'll have to be monitored closely because they may not be hygienic. They may not be able to sustain themselves against Varroa Destructor very well. So it's an opportunity to observe a mixed line of bees now in that colony. So it's interesting, but that's why the different colors. It doesn't mean you're being invaded. It doesn't mean they're being robbed. You have a whole bunch of half sisters within the colony that are from the same queen, different fathers. So there's that. Next question is from Kiki. I hope I said that right. How can I get weaver bees when they don't ship nukes or packages? I know this is frustrating and it's something that I often don't think about when I talk about the lines of bees that I use, which I have two types in my apiary unless they've, as I just mentioned, unless they've swarmed out, new queens were generated and then they fly out and they mate openly here. So um, how do you get them? If you're just starting out, 
and uh, you want to buy a package of bees and you want to get them from the bee weaver family in Texas, which I, I've spoken a lot about them because those bees are doing very well for me here. How do you get them if you don't have bees? They don't ship meat packages. They don't ship nukes. A nuke is a nucleus, frames, bees, brood, everything together. Costly to ship. Probably wouldn't travel very well. The other is people buying packages of bees. And they could ship packages. Those are worker bees that are shipped with a queen that they have not they're not uh, hatched from that queen so they put a bunch of worker bees together put a queen in the cage put that in a package and ship it to you so how do you start if you don't have bees already well here's one of the things that you can do if you have a friend who keeps bees and hopefully you do hopefully you've got some kind of mentor or a resource for your bees uh, somebody catches a swarm let's say you can catch that swarm you can hive that swarm you can let them all settle in for about a week then you can get in there and you can remove the queen and when you remove the queen from that swarm that's when you place your order to have a queen flown in from weaver saskatrass whatever line of queens you want a queen comes through the mail first class or usps priority and uh, you can install a new queen with workers that she is not uh, familiar with that she's not genetically tied to and then you have to be very careful about how well they accept that fertile queen. But fertile queens are generally very easily accepted by a queenless colony. So they have to be queenless for at least three days. And if they're queenless for too long, it can go the other way. They can reject every queen. So, you know, three days to a week is premium. And then you want to replace that queen with a queen that you know the genetics of. And then she can start laying her eggs. 21 to 30 days after that, you're going to start to see that queen's genetics represented in the working force of that colony. And ultimately, the colony will entirely be turned over to whatever genetic line queen that you've bought. So you get bees. If you have a friend that already has a strong colony, they can do a split. They keep their queen. They give you the split bees and they are queenless, which means they may have queen cells, for example. And that's when you fly in your replacement queen and put her in there before uh, those replacement cells hatch out. Then if they accept that uh, queen that you flew in and you installed her and everything's okay and they're feeding her and she starts laying, they'll destroy those queen cells on their own. So that's how you can do it. <clears throat> I know it's no fun if you have no bees. If you're in an area where you can't even get bees, you have to buy them in. Then you're going to have to buy the cheapest stock of bees you can find. If you're, if you're set on getting a bee weaver queen because that's just what I did especially in the spring uh, when I looked at my hives and if I have queenless hives in spring which sometimes happens if you find a colony and there's no eggs and there's no brood and there's nothing but workers in there that's when you can install that queen so if you already have bees that's when you turn over your genetics and that's what I did through the years this is my 13th year of keeping bees and so each year I refresh my stock by flying in queens. So I install them in queenless colonies in the spring. If they've died, if they didn't, what do I do? Make a split. And then I add that. And then guess what you end up with? A bunch of beehives, a bunch of colonies. So you need to control that. And I'm going to be selling off some colonies in the spring. I already have some people that want them, so I'm good to go. I need to get back to 10 after I've done my evaluations of that drawn out synthetic comb. So <clears throat> that's the difference, different colors queens. How can I get the weaver bees? That's by Kiki. Here's another question also from Kiki. Is it wrong to let bees swarm? No. Okay, here's the thing. Remember, we're backyard beekeepers. So where I live now, if you live in town somewhere, I have to backtrack a little bit on this. If you live in town and uh, you've got immediate neighbors, you've got some people that are kind of on the fence about whether they even want you there at all. When your bees swarm out, that puts some people in a panic. They see uh, you know, a cluster of bees on a fence or a tree in their yard or something like that. It's a residential area. They, uh, they're not too happy about it, but it's an opportunity to educate them about your bees. But in areas like that, some people want to reduce swarming because they don't want to panic their neighbors that are uninformed about bees. The other people that generally don't want their bees to swarm are those making a living from their bees, which is very different from backyard beekeeping. 
Uh, commercial beekeepers don't want their bees to swarm. So they're going to make sure that they're not honey bound. They're going to make sure that they have enough boxes so the hive can expand and the colony can increase its numbers in there without being congested. That's when they're likely to swarm. <clears throat> so if they're trying to keep their bees and it's a commercial impact, if productivity drops, then uh, you don't want your bees to swarm. But me personally, because that's who the question comes to, is it wrong to let bees swarm? No, I let my bees swarm all the time. I let bees swarm as often as they want to. Why on earth would I do that? Well, first of all, it refreshes the colony. I get a new queen. We're going into winter right now, and every single colony that I have has a queen in it that's less than a year old. To me, that's ideal. I'm not a queen breeder. I'm not a bee breeder. I don't sell bees. I don't sell honey. I don't provide pollination services. I just have bees in my backyard. So when I let them swarm, now if you've ever seen the aerial videos that I've shared of my environment out here, I have thousands of acres of woodland and wetlands and a river and all these wild areas. So for me, I want my bees to swarm. I want my genetics out there and I want them to occupy uh, bee trees. So there are a lot of trees. We found one just a few days ago, a tree in the woods with bees in it. And that's fantastic because we want to see how the bees are doing in their natural environment. And one of the ways that we can enrich the environment with feral bees is by letting your bees swarm. What else is a benefit from having your bees swarm? Well, they break the brood cycle. What depends on brood? The varroa destructor parasite. So if we have a break in brood, when the, the hive, the colony swarms, the old queen goes out, 50 to 70% of the population of the colony leaves with that queen with a swarm. Sometimes there's an after swarm and you end up with a smaller group of workers in the colony and some cells that will replace the queen. So in the meantime, there's no one laying eggs inside that hive. So the brood stays open, the workers hatch out, and Varroa destructor may have adult bees to attach itself to, but Varroa destructor, the parasite that feeds on the fat of the bees, uh, does not have a place to reproduce. They need capped brood in a beehive in order to reproduce and create offspring and multiply their numbers as Varroa. So the absence of brood that's caused by that natural cycle of swarming, which is speculated that this is how a lot of feral colonies do so well and hold their own and reproduce and continue to occupy the same spaces season after season without any assistance by people is because they're doing a lot of swarming on their own. They're left to do natural reproduction. What's a swarm? That's a colony giving birth to another colony. What colonies do that? Healthy colonies, colonies that are well populated. You see a lot of drones out there? That's a healthy colony. So you know that they're doing well and that their genetics are extended out there. So I personally do not try to stop my bees from swarming. If you look at my apiary, there's only one colony that has more than four boxes on it. And that's because most have two or three, and that's because we put uh, flow supers on there, which is something else that we're going to talk about later. But I personally, there's nothing wrong with allowing bees to swarm. I think it's a natural break. I think it also helps them control Varroa. I think it also helps them to refresh their genetics because they're going to make a new queen and she's going to fly out and she's going to mate with local drones that are acclimatized to that region, to that zone. So you're gonna refresh your apiary and your colonies. So I let them do it all the time because I like to see it. My observation hive, because it is a finite controlled little box that only has eight deep frames in it, I probably got five swarms out of that colony. And guess what? It is extremely strong. They have the most honey they've ever stored Six of those eight frames inside that observation hive are solid honey right now. What are their chances of getting through winter? Very, very good. And because it's warming, they also keep their numbers down that way. When they swarm out, you don't have this giant colony 
with box after box after box of shoulder to shoulder bees because they're generating a swarm and they're getting rid of their numbers and they're refreshing with new numbers of bees. So I see it as a good thing for the backyard beekeeper who has space and uh, isn't depending on them for income. So thank you for that question, Kiki. Next is from Rosa Jorgensen. Can you vacuum flow hives for beetles? Okay, now I, <clears throat> I don't know what part of the world Rosa is in, but uh, here in the United States, the small hive beetle, which by the way, they call it a small hive beetle, it's not that small. I think it's pretty darn big. Uh, I tried to test, just haven't have this beetle jail, beetle trap here. Uh, none of my beetle traps collected beetles. I found one small hive beetle the whole year. And I've been looking for them because I wanted to test different beetle traps, beetle baits. The problem is the population of my colonies are high and healthy and they don't let the beetles get a foothold. But let's say, as uh, Rosa here is asking, let's say they got into your flow super. All right, first of all, I'm in the Northeastern United States in the state of Pennsylvania. Sorry, I didn't say that at the beginning. It gets very cold here. I also have free ranging chickens. Why do I mention the chickens? Because they patrol the bee yard all the time and small hive beetles have to leave the hive, have to go out and pupate. They have to get in the dirt. Now, so they have to transition from the hive to the ground and back to the hive. But of course, when they hatch, they can fly, they're beetles. So they can actually fly and land in the hive and go in. So that phase when they're little worms and they're going out and they're getting into the soil and the chickens are walking through, they can reduce their numbers. But I think it's primarily the cold that takes them out. So through winter, like right now, we've, you know, we've gotten down into the 30s a couple of days, but really winter is not set in. But uh, we don't have small hive beetles. But let's say we did. From the stuff I've seen, and the people, primarily the southern states, the areas that don't get a hard freeze through the winter and the beetles just continue their reproductive cycle through the year. If a small hive beetle family gets a foothold inside your colony, and usually this happens when the physical boxes are much larger and expansive and the number of bees inside cannot patrol the box and keep the beetles out of their honey super. Because when the beetles get in that honey, and uh, they start reproducing, they slime it out. It is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. And if it ever happens, what would I personally do about it? Okay, so let's go to this question. Can you vacuum flow hives for beetles? So if we're saying that the small hive beetle is up in your flow hive and it's in your flow frames, those plastic frames, I'm not gonna try to vacuum them out of there. Now I'm gonna pull that flow super off of there it's just me, this is what I would do, because I overkill everything. I'm gonna pull the whole super off, whether it's got honey in it or not, and I'm gonna put it on a rack, and I'm gonna power wash that thing. And I'm gonna blow those beetles out of there, I'm gonna blast out all the honey. The honey's probably no good anyway. If they've started sliming it, if, if honey is just dripping freely down the face of that and it never sets and it never dehydrates like honey's supposed to, it's been slimed by beetles, get it all out of there. That's what I would do. I'm going to fail safe. So let's say I have a seven frame flow super on there full of honey. That thing weighs over 70 pounds. I pull all the frames out, put them on a rack, which is what we call hog fence. It's just uh, galvanized steel and you put your racks against it and then you power wash that and you blow every bit of honey and everything out of it, including the beetles and everything else. And then you inspect that hive for beetles. And uh, you put in beetle traps and whatever else you need to do, you know, sticky bottom boards, trays underneath the flow hive too, has the trays underneath. You should be putting cooking oil or mineral oil in there. And when the beetles get chased down in there, they can't get back up in the hive. So I'm gonna overkill it. Then what am I gonna do after I power wash those flow supers? I'm gonna hit that with a 10% bleach solution. I'm gonna spray the whole thing. So I'm gonna kill all the bacteria off of that too. So sanitize it with bleach, 10% bleach. You can dip the frames in that and then just air dry them. And then later, when the colony reaches full strength again, put it back in service. But I would not try to go in and try to vacuum out the small hive beetles run and hide in little crevices and places like that. So you can't actually chase them around. So you can trap them, you can develop a colony strength high enough that the bees don't tolerate them, 
But once they're in that super, all bets are off. This is how I would do it. I would not try to vacuum them. I would power wash it to death. And then I would sanitize it with a bleach solution. And then I would air dry it. And then later, as I said, when the colony's up to speed, I would put it back in there. Small hive beetles, I'm so glad I'm not dealing with those. But in advance, I have a contingency in the back of my mind what I would do to deal with them if they came my way. So question number seven. <clears throat> Lots of questions, by the way, and thank you for submitting those. His uh, screen name is Gator Stays, which is kind of interesting. Why mix flow with standards instead of full flow hive stacks? Okay, and I'm sorry, we're talking about flow hives, but the principles are, you know, are the same. You never know, you might need this information. Uh, if you bought a straight flow hive, which is the you know, the flow stand, the flow brood box, the flow super, the flow roof, and so on. Then you keep everything together, but often I mix and match everything. For example, I take standard Langstroth bottom boards. I might put a brood box. It's a Langstroth 10 frame brood box, which is where the queen lays her eggs, where the brood is managed, where they have bee bread, and they start to store honey there, and then they move up into the next super, and then that's honey. So, and so you can get a Langstroth hive and put those pieces together, especially if you live in cold climates. You want, if you want a solid bottom board, you can't get one from Flow Hive, for example. So some of the components that we use in the north are in cold climates. Northern Australia would be warmer. So, but uh, in the north, in North America, in the cold climates, sometimes you want solid bottom boards and stuff. So some of the components that you want on your Flow Hive, your entire beehive, wouldn't come from the flow company. And then so often what I do is I just have the flow super, which is the mechanized frames. So, and uh, when the colony shows adequate strength and they've built up their brood box and then I put that medium super on there and they've filled that with honey, then I just take a flow super and I can put that on any hive. You can get flow supers that match the Langstroth eight frame hives and you can get a flow honey super that matches the 10 frame. Langstroth hives. So then, and that's why, so I've pulled all my flow supers off now. In the spring, I don't know which colony is going to be the strongest. I don't know who's going to come out swinging and they're going to be full of pollen and they're going to build their, their bee population up and they're going to start foraging and they're going to fill their boxes first. Those that demonstrate the greatest foraging strength and those that are bringing in the resources the fastest are going to receive flow supers. So I don't put a flow super on every single hive I have in my colony. Some of them never build up enough to produce a surplus like that. On the flip side, the Saskatraz bees, we started three colonies of Saskatraz bees this year. <clears throat> now listen to this. I put uh, one of those in a flow hive too. So that was the full flow system. And that Saskatraz package of bees that came from California, uh, we drew off seven frames five times. Each frame averages half a gallon of honey. I think this is half a gallon. Half a gallon of honey, each frame times seven, five times. And at one point we would draw off the frames and we do it in two stages. So we did three of the frames one day and then we did the remaining uh, for the next day and uh, within 10 days they were full again and capped again. So that's, the Saskatraz bees are impressive, off the chart impressive. But anyway, you know, that's an example though of we used the full flow system but now we've pulled the flow super off. So now we're doing, uh, I have to put a feeder shim on there because we have to be prepared to feed them for winter. So some of these tools in Australia where the flow hive is developed they don't pull everything down and, and condense it for winter time because their winter is still a time of year when the bees are finding forage and they're still bringing in honey. So a flow super in Australia uh, stays in production all year long. Where here, we shut down production this time of year. So this is the 25th of October. We've been out of production for honey for two weeks. So, and that's why we have the feeding station and everything else. So that's why you can mix and match components when you go flow hybrid. And also it's cheaper just to buy a flow super. In fact, you can just buy flow frames, build your own box to accommodate those frames, 
and have the entire thing be a Langstroth box that just happens to have flow frames in it for harvesting honey. So that's why I do it. You know, it's a mixed mash of equipment. I like to test gear. Um, I just like to swap it out. I do have straight flow hives and everything in it is a flow hive component and that's fine. But when it comes to the top of it, if I need to feed those bees, I have to modify it because none of the flow hives have a hive top feeder. So, and I need to do that. Next is from Monique. Why do you tilt flow hives forward for winter? Another flow hive question, which is fine. Why do I tilt them forward for winter? So the way that, let's say this is the front of a hive, front of a beehive, and it's not just the flow hives, all of your hives, okay, should be tilted slightly towards the landing board side. And that's so that rain and water and everything else shed out of the hive and not into it especially when it comes to solid bottom boards. If the hives were tilted back or even just level, when the snow piles up against that beehive and it starts to melt against the hive, then the snow is gonna drip down onto that board. And if it's packed with snow, where's the warm melted water go? Inside the hive. So if it's tilted towards the landing board, then any melt off is gonna run off and down to the ground instead of into the hive, which increases humidity and creates problems for the bees, right? The other thing is flow hives have a tray in the bottom. The flow hive two in particular has a compartmentalized plastic tray in the bottom part of the support stand for the hive. So normally it's tilted back because we drain the honey out of the back of that hive and it goes through tubes, goes into jars. And if you haven't seen it, look at my flow hive video series. But uh, so during the productive year, that's fine. It's not freezing. Rainwater can go in. There is a front landing board that is tilted down and away from the hive, but that's not ready for winter. So what I do is at the end of the year, I level up the hive and now the landing board sheds water this way and it's slightly tilted forward. The reason is again, when snow piles up against that hive and it starts to melt, we get those weird warm days. Like we'll get several days where we build up a couple of feet of snow. And then you get a weird 60 degree or 65 degree day. And then all the snow up against the beehive starts to melt. Where's it go? It goes inside. Where's it going to go on a flow hive too? It's going to go inside and the water's going to fall into the tray underneath. What's wrong with that? Well, it's going to freeze again, maybe the same night. Now you've got a plastic tray in the bottom that has water in it. And those trays do not have rounded edges. They're not camphored so that as ice develops in there, it would just naturally lift up and out. It will break up your tray. So the trays can't handle being filled with water from a snow melt and then freezing, it'll crack out the tray and then you've got a ruined piece of equipment. So you resolve those issues by settling your hives from vertical to slightly forward uh, from winter time. And then in spring, we'll tilt them back again. We'll go back into production. That's why I tilt them because of where I live. One year, we got almost a hundred inches of snow. Think about that. I need snowshoes to go out and check my uh, chicken coops and stuff. So that's why I do that. Next is from Mr. Credit Union. What is the typical feeding schedule for fall and winter? And when do I add Ultra B patties? All right, when you're feeding, and let's face it, we're in a dearth right now. So what's the condition of your beehives, first of all? So if you're going around, some people have uh, broodminder scales on their beehives. I don't have one, but uh, they're constantly looking at the physical weight of their beehives with these broodminders. I think that's what it's called. Uh, they sit underneath the hive and as the bees are bringing on weight, the broodminder logs it through your phone or some other digital device. And then you can see the trends. Oh, they're losing weight. Oh, they gained weight again. Oh, they're losing weight. This time of year, they'll start to lose weight, but how much weight is on? So if we have 50 or more pounds of honey on a hive that's in a deep box and there's a medium super, that's my winter configuration. Uh, that medium box by itself is averaging 47 to 50 pounds. So that's full of honey and the brood boxes also are partially honey. So there's a lot of weight there. So do they have what they need already? The other thing is if you're talking about one to one feed, one part sugar, one part water, 
Most people shift as it gets colder to two to one, two part sugar, one part water by weight. Then uh, you need to stop feeding that too because it's a liquid. And when you're putting a liquid in there, the bees need to dehydrate it. To dehydrate it, they need to fan air through the hive. And if it's gonna get into freezing temperatures, the bees don't like to do that. Now we have condensation problems in the hive. So we want to lower the humidity levels in the hive so we stop feeding. So when it comes to the syrup, I stopped feeding syrup, if at all. This year, I really didn't feed syrup. I did put out honey because I had them cleaning up honey supers. So, but honey brought into the hive, how much dehydration does that require? None. So they put it right in the cells and it's ready to go. So honey is good to go. So if we're talking about two to one sugar, one to one sugar, sugar syrups, it's time to stop. Once you get the freezing temps at night, time to stop. So then the next question is, when do I add Ultra B patties? For those of you who don't know, Ultra B is a patty, a protein supplement that is made by Man Lake. And uh, there have been a lot of scientific studies done on feed supplements. So Ultra B patties do well. The thing is, this happens a lot with backyard beekeepers. They're looking at their bees like their cat or their dog or a pet and they just wanna give it every treat that they can think of to keep them going. But here's the thing, there's a natural reproductive rhythm with your super colony, with your super organism, which is the bee colony, and they're supposed to slow down this time of year. They're supposed to reduce their numbers this time of year, and they're supposed to have a manageable brood area that the bees can cluster around and keep warm so they survive winter. If you start putting in protein patties and providing supplements that stimulate the bees to expand that brood pattern, then first of all, why are we expanding brood going into fall? Do we need a bigger workforce to forage all those resources in November and December and January? No, we don't. What we'd really like them to do is economize their numbers. And then the resources that they need to survive winter are also reduced. If you've got a giant colony with thousands of bees in it, then they have to feed them through winter. So if their numbers naturally decline, as the resources in the environment decline, the queen will stop laying, she'll slow her laying, and then the resources on the hive are not being stressed. They're able to care for the brood that they have. So you should see the brood numbers reduced going into winter. And if we artificially stimulate them and make them think the environment is providing resources that it isn't, and they kick up a bunch of brood, then when you stop feeding those patties, now they're gonna starve. Now they're gonna use their resources faster because there's more demand on those resources. So my personal practice is not to put pollen resources out or protein supplements or patties like this, Ultra B, even though it's great stuff, the time that you wanna start looking at protein supplements and boosts like that would not be during the heavy winter months, but rather wait until late February, early March, then you can put those protein patties in there because what do we want to happen? That's when they start expanding the brood. They've got the workers to cover the brood to keep it warm. And we want those to be hatching out, increasing the numbers so they can have more brood, more workers to warm the brood and so on and exponentially expand until boom, when the, the blossoms start coming out and when all of that pollinating has to happen, you've got this terrific workforce to do it. Now you have to ask yourself the question, why are you keeping your bees and what do you need them for? because the people that are really putting huge resources into boosting the colony, feeding as early as you can, adding protein supplements, getting the biggest brood batch that you can get going, and the largest numbers in the bee colony that you can possibly have, they are trying to earn money from their bees or they do that by providing pollination services. So you gotta be ready when the spring bloom happens. The more bees you have, the more pollination you can provide, the more money you can derive from that. The other thing is if you're selling queens or you're selling packages, people are gonna be buying those when? In the spring. So they also have to stimulate their colonies to maximum production as early as they possibly can so they can sell queens, package bees, nukes, 
They want the numbers to be huge because that is their product. As a backyard beekeeper, you have to ask yourself, what is your product? If you're just trying to keep your bees healthy and alive, then learn to evaluate the colony to see if they have the resources they need to survive. You don't need to build a super colony. You don't need to have this great expanse of numbers. You don't have to have a spring workforce that's gonna go out and overproduce the box that they're living in. So if you're a backyard beekeeper, you stop feeding with syrup in the fall, you don't put any patties on there, unless you want, you have to keep putting protein patties on once you start, then what's the purpose of your workforce? Just to keep the colony alive? Well, you can keep your colony alive because you left honey on for them, because you're not in the honey business. So just as I showed in a recent video, which showed how I pull off those flow supers, what's right under it? Boxes full, wall to wall, with capped honey. That's their resource they feed themselves. That's, that's why bees are so fantastic to keep. They create this huge surplus. And then every opportunity they have to fly out when the weather's warm as early as February where I live. Late January, early February, they're going to go out and they're going to start bringing in pollen. They're going to boost their own brood that way. So then we have the bees that are the best foragers performing the best. So you don't have to artificially, everybody that makes Ultra Bee, whether it's the pollen substitute, the dry stuff, I have a 50 pound bag of it right now. Whether it's the uh, pollen patties, I bought big boxes of those too. Guess what, my bees didn't eat them, why? Because early in the year when you go to put the patties on, they're already bringing in their own pollen, so it was a complete waste for me. So depending on where you live, you may not have to supplement your bees. You may not have to put on pollen patties. I mean, Man Lake wants you to buy all that stuff. Everybody that makes dog treats wants you to buy them to give them to your dogs, but they don't need that beyond their normal diet. So the bees, when they forage and they start to find the pollen that they need, they're gonna naturally stimulate the colony to develop and expand and prepare for spring on their own without your help. How do you know if they have the resources they need? Well, those who have those broodminder scales are gonna know how light the colony is. Bees have weight too. So they're gonna know how much honey you have on. I'm gonna take something like this FLIR camera. This is the FLIR C2. I go out, I look at my apiary with this thing, and I shoot the box, and I look at where the cluster is, and I can see that on the surface because my hives are not insulated. If they're insulated, this doesn't work. But I look at my hives, ah, the cluster is still in the brood box. They haven't even moved into the honey super. So if it's anything like last year, none of the bees used up the honey that they stored in preparation for winter. So now what happens in spring, they add more honey in and they've still got the old honey and they start to build that down and that's when they get honey bound because they run out of space and they can't have room for brood. So leave enough honey on for them. That is the absolute best thing you can do. Forget the syrup, forget the pollen patties. If you're a backyard beekeeper, keep healthy bees, let the hive build up naturally, let them store their own resources. Don't take off all of their resources in the fall. Why would you do that? unless you're just so anxious to show everyone that you can get honey from your beehive. If you have a small colony of bees, and I have several now that I took nothing off of them because I just wanted them to build up their colonies to get through winter and have their own resources. That's a self-contained unit right there. And then if the environment provides what they need, they're good to go. This whole idea of stoking your colonies and pushing them and getting as much nutrition in there and as much feed in there that you can and get the broods as big as you can get them, that is for production. That is for people that are hoping to make money from their beehives and isn't necessarily the goal of a backyard beekeeper. Your goal is to keep bees and enjoy them. And in my case, to observe them and observe their behaviors and everything. And as much as possible, I'd like those behaviors to be natural. And I want their diet to be natural as well. But, uh, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I have all the stuff. I, uh, if I think a colony would benefit from it, if they did, if I looked at my thermal camera and they were at the top, do you think I'm not going to feed them? Oh, I'm going to. So I'm going to put food in their rapid round feeder on the top. I am going to, you know, you can put dry feed in there if you want to, not dry pollen, but if you wanted to put pollen patties in, you put your pollen patties right on top of those brood frames. And of course, I'm gonna boost a colony that is starving. 
But if they've got their own resources, there's no reason to continue to stoke and add beyond what they need to make it. So stop feeding syrup when you get your first rows of nights. Don't start unless you got some kind of huge dearth in the spring and your bees are light and they've used their resources and they're trying to build their brood and you know, you look at the forecast, you have two weeks of rain coming and cold weather. Well, sure, feed your bees then because they're gonna be using that up right away once spring breaks. So, you know, you're gonna seasonally, you're gonna figure it out for your own area. And uh, number 10 was, how do I check feed in winter without exposing the bees to the cold? So that leads me to another, this is my method. So this year I put what I call hive feeder shims on my uh, beehives and I'll put a link in the video description for that. Make a note there. Um, I showed you how to make these feeder shims and they go on any box. You can make them for eight frame, you can make them for 10 frame. And then what I put in there is uh, we put wrap it around feeders inside. So it's a box by itself and it's vented on the front. And we learned this year that my bees don't want any venting. They sealed it all up with propolis. They don't have any venting through the top. There's a hole through the inner cover of the uh, feeder shim. So this is a standard uh, inner cover, for example. You've got this uh, hole through the top here. And this hole is uh, shaped wrong for a rapid round feeder, for example. So what I do is I just cut a piece of plank wood, I put it over that hole right there, and that keeps all the bees from coming up into this space. Then I put, notice that this rapid round has a little extension in the middle. I put that over the hole and I set it on there. Now, there's a box around this. You can use a shallow super. You can use a medium super to enclose this feeder. Then in the winter time, when you open up the top of your hive, you don't have to worry about exposing the bees. What they'll do, by the way, is they're gonna propolize this and this is gonna be sealed. The wood is gonna be stuck to this board. This is gonna get stuck to the, the piece of wood that you put on there. And look, there's this cup that prevents a draft. You take that off if you're running dry feed around here. So if you put your dry feed, some people put sugar, some people mix fondant, things like that. And you put this cover on, the bees have access inside this space to all the food. You can also check on it to see if it's gone. If it is, you replenish it. You put this right back on and you're good to go. In the early spring, when we still have those cold days, but you're gonna start feeding a sugar syrup, you put your sugar syrup in there, but you put this cap on and that keeps the bees from swimming out into the syrup. And you also have this lid on. So you still have a space, you have a physical barrier that prevents the cold air and everything from getting out down into the lower boxes. And you have a serviceable feeder on top. You have a outer box here and then you have a standard hive cover over that. So with a configuration like this, regardless of what type of feeder you're using, but if your only access for the feed is through that center hole, then you have the opportunity to shelter the hive from inclement weather when you open it up. And you can check these in the middle of winter if you want to, because your bees are down below preserving their heat and they're clustered up and they're trying to protect their uh, brood from the cold. So it's very simple. Hive top feeders give you access to the feed resources just as the bees do without uh, exposing the bees to the cold. I don't, that's why I don't like the frame feeders and I don't like inverted jar feeders, by the way. The inverted jar feeders, I mean, obviously this isn't one, but let's say it was one, you put this thing over here, this is honey, but, uh, and by the way, when it comes to my observation hive, I feed them straight honey if they need it. This year, they're not gonna need it because I can look right in that thing and see it's full of honey. So I don't feed them anything. But if this was a, a jar with uh, holes in the bottom and this sits on that uh, inner cover and you've got your, your super, empty super around it as shelter and then you've got the roof on, for example, where I live, you'll get uh, down to the 20s at night. And then that following day, it might go all the way up to 55. There's an air gap up here. And when it warms up, that expands, pushes all the liquid out, and it drips right down onto a cluster of bees that are still trying to survive. And now they're cold and wet, 
and many colonies have been completely wiped out by using inverted feeders that got exposed to a hot day following a cold night. It expanded, pressed the feed down in, and then the bees all got wet, and then what happened, it cycled right back to a freezing day. The outer edges of that cluster have to be able to migrate into the center, and they have to be able to generate warmth. They can't do it, and they get wet. That's why I don't use any kind of inverted feeder in the climate that I live in. Also, if you had to check and pull that off, uh, there are a lot of problems that I've noticed with inverted feeders. You know, the holes get plugged up, the bees can't quite get to them. The rapid rounds are good. There's some new feeders coming down the pike that uh, I just found out about yesterday. And uh, so I may be evaluating some new feeder designs coming up. We'll wait and see what that's about. But uh, I'm concerned about reservoirs that can expand and express their fluid down directly onto your bee cluster. So the rapid rounds right now on an air cover, don't expose your bees to the cold during winter. Don't open your winter beehives unless, remember, if you don't have a thermal camera, you're gonna have to probably pull it open to look to see if there's resources. But uh, if you crack that open a little bit and you see that there's honey in there and uh, it's still capped and everything, close it up right away. Don't fool around. Don't chill those bees more than you have to. Now the next question came about, I have a five gallon pail of this out in my bee shed. JP writes, feeding pro sweet this winter in a round top feeder. I'm thinking he's talking about the rapid round, which is like this. There are round feeders also from Be Smart Designs that are tank feeders that go inside and they're fed in the top. But uh, he's in round top feeder, is that okay? So here's the thing, pro sweet. We know that sugar syrup uh, turns bad really fast. Okay, so ProSweet, again, is made by Man Lake. So they're putting out, it's kind of a one-to-one -one sugar mix, but it's got other types of sugars in it, and they've also boosted it with a lot of healthy nutrition for your bees. ProSweet's some expensive stuff. As I said, I've got a five-gallon thing of it. When am I gonna use that? I'm gonna use ProSweet in the spring if I have a colony of bees that does not have the resources they need to get through. So I'm gonna pour pro sweet into the rapid round. Would I do it this time of year? No way. I'm not putting any liquid. I don't care what it's, you know, how awesome it is, how vitamin packed it is, what kind of amino profile it's got. I'm not using any kind of liquid feed this time of year. The, the closest thing is going to be, if you have real honey left over, you can feed them that. Uh, if it's already in the frames, all the better. Now, there's some discussion about don't be swapping around frames from one colony to another and so forth. First of all, don't be breaking apart your colonies just as we're going into winter because inside those colonies, the bees have connected everything together with all of their burr comb and all of their propolis and they've sealed everything and they've made it the way they want it this time of year and they've controlled the ventilation and everything else. So now that it's cold, if you're pulling things apart and pulling frames and everything else, you're disrupting things that the bees cannot easily repair this time of year because they don't do a lot of wax repair in the cold in the winter time, if any. So be as, as non-destructive to your colony as you possibly can this time of year. So ProSuite, again, I'm just evaluating it now. I've never had it before. Again, mostly uh, commercial beekeepers like to use it and uh, it's going to provide nutrients that your bees don't get from regular sugar syrup. But uh, so I don't have anything, you know, to say about its effectiveness. I will say, though, I would treat it the same as I would any one to one sugar syrup and not provide it for the bees unless we're getting into spring where the warm up is happening and they're in a dearth and they need those resources because they're not bringing in the nectar on their own. Those of you who are using Broodminder scales on your, on your uh, beehives, write down in the comments below if that's helped you evaluate where your bees are at as far as uh, the resources that they have in winter. But uh, ProSweet this winter, don't feed in winter. I would recommend refeeding it, feeding it in spring. Those of you who don't have ProSweet, that don't wanna spend the money, use refined sugars. It really doesn't make a difference if it's cane sugar or beet sugar. 
but the refined white sugar, mix your sugar syrups from that, and then put that on in the spring. Or if you're in an area where it never freezes, when they have a dearth and they need the resources to survive. Uh, okay, so here we go. Next question, why don't you kill drones or remove drone comb? Okay, we touched on this a little earlier. Uh, it's a game I play personally. I like my colonies to generate lots of drones. I like to send all of my drones out. I like to spread my genetics for my colonies that are doing so well. First of all, which colonies have the most drones to begin with? The healthy colonies. The colonies that have piles of resources start to build drones. They, uh, they'll hatch drones out and they'll spread their genetics. So if you've got a huge population of bees in your colony, and I'm showing a video right here or right here, of drones on landing boards right now, all of my colonies are generating huge numbers of drones. I don't know of any colonies that are gonna swarm right now. If they did, that would be really unfortunate for them. But uh, I want my drones out there. I'm not gonna kill and pull out drone comb uh, because the drones, once they hatch out, that comb becomes available for other resources. They'll put nectar and stuff in drone comb. It won't always be used for drone brood. So, I let them generate drones. I want those genetics out there. If there's a virgin queen out there flying around, I want my drones to be the ones to mate with her because they're going to be the best. And then I expand my genetics into my entire area and the surrounding beekeepers get swarms and mated queens from my drones, which right now are bee weaver and saskatrass, except for my one renegade saskatrass colony that obviously swarmed. And then they genetically mixed with those Italian bees. So yeah, we want to send out strong drones. We want them to go far and wide and breed. If you've got great bees, your drones are your genetics and that's how you're going to control your environment. I have a neighbor that lives a couple of miles away who says he's never bought bees in his life and he's been keeping bees for a very long time. And he shows me a map of where everybody's located. So basically, you know, when we generate our swarms, there are some beekeepers that are collecting those swarms and adding to their genetic base. So we want good genetics, we want our drones, and we want to see that the colonies are healthy. That's one great indicator of colony health is when you see a lot of drones, uh, you know, they have the resources to feed them because the drones, as we all know, are the first to go when there's a dearth, when it starts to get cold. With as many drones as are out in my apiary right now, uh, within the next couple of weeks, there's gonna be this mass killing of drones. They're just gonna be pushing them out because right now they're so vibrant, they're so healthy, they're flying constantly. It's amazing how many drones are out there. But that's why I don't kill them because I'm all about the genetics and uh, getting those spread out. Plus, I'd really like to provide those genetics to the, uh, the feral colonies that are surviving in the woods and stuff. That's an area of interest. That's why I don't do it. And number 13, sorry this is going so long. A lot of people like really fast videos. That is not what today's about. And that's not kind of who I am. I will waste time if I'm gonna sit here and do a lot of talking. Number 13, you said to pull feeders and use a fresh one every time. What if I just refill the feeders without removing the feeder? Okay, I think that was earlier on this year when we were talking about feeding your bees. I mentioned that these, these wrap it around feeders in particular, these are so inexpensive, so I have a bunch of them. And what I do is to limit the time that I'm out there checking my bees and opening hives, even those uh, feeder shims that I have. I come out there and pull the existing feeder because what happens to your sugar syrup anyway? If, if those bees are not consuming that within three to five days, you need to get it out of there anyway because you're gonna to start to see little bits of black mold and stuff. So you really need to pull this feeder and come out there with a fresh feeder, put the fresh feeder in and then fill that. But in order to answer this question, you said pull feeders. Uh, what if I just refill them? Okay, here's what you can do. Let's say you just mixed up a batch of it's springtime and you went with one-to-one -one sugar syrup. Pound of sugar, pound of water. And then you mix that up. What can I do to keep that water from spoiling? And when I pour it in the feeder, how can I make sure that it doesn't get spoiled by any bacteria that's already starting in this feeder? You can add bleach to it. 
So you can take regular household bleach unscented and you can put one teaspoon of unscented bleach in one quart of one to one sugar syrup. So when you do that, it's going to smell like a swimming pool. Is that going to be detrimental to your bees? No. Have you ever said bees will drink from a swimming pool? They'll drink from chlorinated water. The bees, even when I've cleaned flow frames with 10% uh, bleach solution after it's dried out, it smells like bleach. The bees go right after it. They act like there's absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. So you can add a teaspoon of unscented bleach to a quart of sugar syrup, whether it's two to one or one to one, whatever you're doing. If you want to extend that sugar syrup so it doesn't spoil, and if you're going to be pouring it into a feeder that's already sitting there that you did not feel like pulling off for whatever reason, maybe you don't have any extras, it will sanitize that feeder when you pour in that uh, bleach amended sugar syrup. So that's one method. So if you're lazy or you don't have more feeders, then you can leave that feeder in place. Sometimes they're propolized down really well and maybe you don't want to pull it or maybe it just looks really clean. Well, we can't see bacteria. So add that teaspoon of unscented household bleach to your quart of sugar syrup, pour that in there. You'll sanitize the feeder and extend the life of your syrup if they can't get up there and drink it right away. So it's a win-win. The, the bleach, Clorox bleach, whatever brand you're using, uh, dissipates on its own over time. And, and in fact, if you wanna know what the condition is of that uh, syrup, get those swimming pool test papers and see what the chlorine level is. Suitable for people, suitable for bees. So that's what you can do. Bleach in your syrup, teaspoon per quart. If you're mixing up a whole gallon of it, four to five teaspoons in the gallon. And it will extend the life of it, sanitize the drinkers. Because some of the drinkers too, by the way, have configurations that are fairly complex. So you can add that, or you don't want to pull it off. If you've got one of those great big uh, carousel feeders, Saracel, however you want to say it, uh, you may not want to pull it off. You may just want to add to it. Well, the bleach is going to sanitize that too and it's safe for your bees. So there's that. That is it for today. I know that went so fast, you probably can't even believe it. But uh, so that's the frequently asked questions for today. If you have questions that have come to mind while you're listening to this, go ahead and write them down in the comment section below. If you're not a subscriber, there's a new uh, algorithm now that when I'm trying to answer questions that people write, when I go to my channel, YouTube now lets me see only the questions that are posted by subscribers. So those who subscribe and those that you can also click on the little bell down in the right hand corner after your subscriber to get the alerts whenever there's a new video. But uh, the subscribers will get my answers first. And uh, those who are not subscribers may eventually, if I have the time, I will get to those questions. But if you are a subscriber, your answer will get priority. It's only right. So thanks for watching. I hope you have a fantastic weekend and uh, I hope you enjoyed today's FAQ. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.